Perhaps you've heard the terms functional versus non-functional training. Dr. Miller here with the, some background information on what these two terms mean and how it might look in training. Is there something that's a real phenomenon? What is these? You know, what are these terms? So, first of all, remember hypertrophy is in increased size of the muscle, so cross functional size of the muscle. The idea is that we can have this non-functional type of training, this functional type of training. So, in other words, if we're talking about strength or power, we could have a gain in non-functional cross-sectional area. Okay. And then if you know if we did things right, we'd have this gain of functional. I, I don't really like these words. I'm going to use them because they're popular, but they play into more of this idea of training specificity instead, right? Specific adaptations to pose demands. So there is some 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 quote unquote truth to this, but it's only related to the law of specificity. So it's not like this uh, this wild idea. Um, now there had been date in the, uh, debate in the past about these two terms that non-functional function relate to, which is sarcoplasmic hypertrophy and uh, myofibular hypertrophy. So in other words, sarcoplasmic uh, hypertrophy is supportive uh, structures like mitochondrial density, perhaps more enzymatic, uh, con higher concentration of enzy enzymes responsible for anaerobic metabolism, increased glycogen, even fat stores. These are all things that would support the muscle as opposed to functional would be added in more myofibrils. And so I drew some pictures here that kind of demonstrate this idea if this blue circle represents a muscle fiber or cell. And these little white bubbles in here, again, this is just the way I drew it. It's a crude representation of a muscle fiber. But those little white circles might represent bundles of myofibrils, so the actual contractile protein. So in a non-functional cell, you see, the most, you see both of these fibers are the same size, but the actual fiber composition or the uh, myofibril composition in each fiber is different, okay? How does this come about? What does it mean? How does it look in training? Well, non-functional then would be like a bodybuilder saying, look, what's the goal of bodybuilding? You get the biggest muscle possible. Does that cross-sectional area of muscle mass, as it increases, does it produce more force? Yes. However, the way the bodybuilder trains is a higher volume, more repetitions per set, more sets with these mid-range repetitions. There's, bodybuilders don't typically train all the time with sets under six, they'll change with repetitions that are in the, mo in the moderate range, and I'll explain why that is as well, but those type of longer uh, time under tension will produce more changes that are in line with the way you're trained, specificity of training. So in other words, you've been creating a hypoxic environment in the muscle, okay? You've been exercising fibers that are uh, more submaximal, and you're taking the big fibers, you know, X's turning into A's and making them more aerobic in nature, more fatigue resistant. And so you get more supportive tissue. That's what the body's going to do. The body re registers a, a, something that's a threat to homeostasis. So it adapts by adapting in cord, right? So it's going to block or it's going to try to reduce the amount of fatigue that occurred last time you're trained. And if you go to failure, it's even more heightened. I'm not saying go to failure, but that's part of bodybuilder training. You're going to go to failure a lot closer or occasionally to failure than you would than doing the other type of functional type of training. It's easy to get volume in this way. So my bodybuilders train with 4x10 rather than 10x4 with appropriate loads. 10x4 is going to beat you up and it'll be very difficult to recover from before the next training session. So in, in, the, you know, in response, then the body increases cross-section area, but it may not all be due to force. So, you know, some of these really large bodybuilders, they're still strong, but they could be even stronger. I mean, they're, they're, you know, gigantic human beings. And don't get me wrong, they're incline pressing 405 and you know, leg pressing 2,000 pounds. They're still very freaking strong. It's just the muscles are, if they were really, quote, unquote, functional hypertrophy occurred, they'd be even stronger. Now, on the other side, you have functional training where we had more myofibrils. So it's less about time under tension and accumulation of volume. It's more about the intensity that drives hypertrophy. Now, volume is the driver of hypertrophy, it seems, right, from the research literature we have, and it makes sense. And so, you know, what happens when a, let's say, an Olympic-style weightlifter or powerlifter trains, they're not going to use as much volume in a training session because they can't. I mean, it'll, it'll, you know, to do 10 sets of four versus four sets of 10 is very different. We all know that, right? If with appropriate loading. So if you did 10 sets of four, you know, with the 80 something percentage versus four sets of 10 with a 70 something percentage, that's sustainable. That 70% is not as much joint wear and tear. It's not as much neurological damage. You know, it's, a, it's akin to sprinting versus jogging, right? It's the same issue. You can only do so many sprints before you acute fatigue. It starts to beat up your body, but you can run for a long period of time, so maximally. Um, and so it's the same idea. So what's happening then is, yes, you're going to hypertrophy from those um, heavy loading sessions, but it's going to take longer to accumulate enough volume in order to see the noticeable gains in hypertrophy. And that's not the athlete's goal anyway. That might be a field court sport athlete, Olympic weightlifter. It's not necessarily to build muscle mass. All that will happen. It's just going to take more time. Okay. It could even be hypothesized, I think based just on understanding physiology, 
and how cross-sectional area tends to stick around and what's attracting water into the cell that the functional type of hypertrophy is going to stick around longer even during detraining periods. Now that's a little bit of my opinion as well, so don't hang your hat on that, but certainly um, it, would, it would be supported by you know, loss of strength and loss of size of that relative to one another if somebody goes in atrophy. Again, that's just my opinion. There's some research to kind of dance around this issue, but that's, again, take it mostly as opinion here. But this idea of functional, non-functional, you know, increase in myofibrils rather than increase in structural or supportive structures is held up. Um, and it was, it was debated for a while, but I don't think there's, I think it came to the conclusion that there's no other plausible explanation for why these two things are happening. Okay, and this would also, you know, explain type of training determines type of soreness. Do you need skeletal muscle hypertrophy in order to see strength gains? Yes and no, but the way that it's expressed, hypertrophy is expressed, is important. Okay, so let's put this in a real world setting. Who would need non-functional, let's say we're talking about athletes, not bodybuilders, who could use non-functional training? Well, somebody who's in a contact or collision sport, like a football player, a rugby player, they need body mass now. You could also argue that you could get non-functional uh, gains I uh, should see them, and I put this in a, just a video I released just a little bit ago on, with, high, with weightlifters in the upper body. So not only protecting from the bar, because you got to rack the bar, sometimes the bar crashes, but even the supportive structures that hold the bar, right, like putting a bar on your back, it's nice to have some muscle mass back there, and the muscles that support movement. So like pulling a bar off the floor, keeping your back posture, uh, keeping your back uh, line intact, um, you know, the muscles that are responsible for going overhead, like a triceps. Now, you would say, well, don't we want functional hypertrophy? True. But non-functional hypertrophy happens faster than functional. It's easier to accumulate enough volume doing that type of submaximal work than it is functional. So why not just gain some muscle mass? Are you as strong as you could be in terms of the quality of muscle? No. Are you gaining strength, though, in your triceps by doing non, non-functional type of training? Again, which I think is a silly term. But are you doing that? Yes, you're still getting stronger. It's not like it's all or none here. Like if I do non-functional, well, I just got a bunch of uh, mitochondria. I didn't get any. No, you're still getting crop. You're getting myofibrils, you're just not optimizing as many myofibrils per area of cross-section of the muscle as you could. If somebody needs to gain mass pretty fast and not beat them up with a ton of heavy work in terms of joint stress, like a weightlifter, non-functional bodybuilding type type of training, which I, again, I don't like the word functional, but bodybuilding type of training is a better option. Okay. And so that's, that makes sense then for the athlete maybe to do some more heavy loading in the lower body. And, you know, more akin to the sport, you want to get them stronger, they're going to have hypertrophy over time. But then on the non-functional side, you're going to have them train the upper body in such a way. And a lot of people do this already, but that's why we might do it is because there's different types of hypertrophy. So just something to think about. You can disagree me. Disagree. You can disagree with me. You can disagree with me. Put your comment in the bottom and I'll take a look at it. Bottom of the page here. Subscribe to my channel if you like some other top, like topics related to exercise and sports science, fitness, nutrition science. Uh, and if you like this video, give it a thumbs up. Be sure to hit the notification bell as well. I'm releasing videos all the time. I hope you again found this information valuable as you think about training and how both of these, these different types of hypertrophy might fit the situation. It's not a one size fits all typically. Even in an athlete, you might have differing needs between the upper and lower body. More than likely with most athletes, field court sport athletes, whatever it might be, the lower body is probably gonna be more on the functional side. It's not about gaining bigness. It's about gaining quality. For the upper body, though, it might be beneficial to quickly gain mass and not beat the body up. Uh, and you can use some maximal type of bodybuilding training a lot easier for the athlete to see those accumulated gains, whether it be for padding the athlete from collisions or contact or and or um, from gaining some quick strength, even though it's not optimal to the cross-sectional area of the muscle.